All right. Now, last week at this time, we had our favourite Labour MP, um, Ingrid Leary, on from Tyree. First of all, can I just say, Ingrid, are you still sitting? No, um, but I do have one more select committee meeting on Monday, a little bit of a marathon, 9 till about 2.30 for finance and expenditure, and then I will be able to uh, sit on the couch and take a deep breath. Depart and decamp. It's been a big year. Um, now, can I just twitch you, though, just quietly, by-election result? Mm. Oh, look, um, I think low voter turnout to be expected. Um wouldn't read too much into it and we're positioned pretty well to have a good fight in that bellwether seat next year. Oh, I, I think, yeah, good on you. Um, uh, you. You didn't expect it, I'm sure, to be quite that pronounced though, did you? Uh, look, I, I didn't. I thought it was going to be within a thousand votes. Mm. Um, I think it is probably because of poor voter turnout and you know, I'm not going to blame the weather, but it didn't help that it was a rainy day. We we know that the left don't turn out as well on rainy days. Why Let's hope for a sunny day next time. Why is that? Why don't your voters get out on a um, wet day? Because it's more difficult uh, for a lot of them. Uh, and I think it was really interesting, your um, discussion just now about that stuff article, because I tend to agree with it, you know, even within our own party, we have a lot of university educated people, including myself. And Mike Moore, the uh, you know late Mike Moore, wrote a really interesting book about where the Labour Party is and being the party of the working class and so on. Um, I know my relatives from my dad's side of the family, they were those people and something like bad weather would be enough to make it really difficult because they didn't have a car to get out and vote. They weren't, you know, they, they probably would have had to catch a bus, it would have been whether they had enough money. Those are the day-to-day things that, you know, can stop access for some people. So I, I also think that article um, gives us a lot to think about. Yeah, because the Labour Party, it, it looks like it's from the outside dominated by academics and school teachers. Um, and that sort of traditional, conservative, working class block, they seem to be shopping around a bit at the moment, don't they? No, I, I think that it may look like there's a lot of academics and certainly got a lot of lawyers, but we also have a lot of people who truly represent the working class communities that they serve and I would say they represent that a lot more than um, those in the opposition or in the ACT party. I think what we always must be true to though is ensuring that when we make our selections, uh, when we work with our people on the ground, that we are representing communities, our working communities and that's why our selections are tilted in favour of the local people choosing their candidate rather than uh, you know, New Zealand Council. Um, I'd hate that rule to ever change because then I do think we're in peril of becoming more elitist or, or you know, only representing a small group of people. You do need academic brains in a caucus, obviously, because we're dealing with legislation, making laws. There's technical elements. But, you know, we need to be as representative as possible. I think our party is still that, but we need to keep watching that and make sure we don't become too close to the middle. Um when you say too close to the middle, isn't the middle where you want to be if you're going to govern the country? I mean, that was sort of uh, the Helen, de- that was sort of the Helen Clark trick, really. She got that middle. <clears throat> yeah, and speaking as a backbench MP, um, those issues are for people who are in the executive. I probably sit quite on the left within my own party, and we know that the economic um, approaches of both National and Labour have become way more similar over the years and so we've got to look at what distinguishes our policies from each other and I think that you know the the economic policies are one it's you know how far do you get involved with the market how far do you allow the market to sort of correct itself I probably sit slightly to the left in those debates. Well then um, just before you came on I was talking about the schmozzle that we're about to go through now I'm not going to blame you at all for this it's just it's a unique set of circumstances in 2023 you've got inflation rampant and it's true it's throughout the western world I mean New Zealand's not unique in that respect but 
you've only got one lever to control that inflation, and that's the Reserve Bank and its interest rates policy. And I guess also things like tightening um, lending ratios uh, with the major trading banks as well. But it's a pretty brutal and, and, and blunt instrument. Here they are saying we want to put the economy into, well, to be, almost put it to sleep, basically, um, into a sort of mini-recession to try and get control of inflation. And yet we've got 50,000 people probably they're talking about would lose their jobs. And yet the irony is we've got a massive labour shortage in New Zealand that even if you took that 50,000 out, there'd probably still be jobs vacant in this country. It's a unique set of circumstances, isn't it? Yeah, it's tricky. A lot of it has been caused by overseas um, factors, you know, including the war in Ukraine, COVID and so on. And But the, this is the dilemma for the Minister of Finance. And I wouldn't want to be in his shoes because he has to, on one hand, provide the targeted support that helps mitigate the impact of inflation on vulnerable people. And on the other hand, not overstimulate the economy, as you quite rightly say, and cause inflation to go higher. So getting the balance is going to be the trick. Um, that's what he has to look at. And he's very clearly signalled that his whole approach going into the next budget will be about getting that balance right. All right. Well, does that account for the reason the Prime Minister said over very publicly at her press conference on Monday, do you think, um, to her ministers, a very clear public stare think very carefully about your portfolios heading into the new year and what she meant was what what really are you going to do is was some of that reflected in what the prime minister said yes i believe so i think that um managing an economy is always an iterative process you have to be able to respond and adapt as things change and as we've seen the persistent inflation it's absolutely right in that environment for the Prime Minister to say, let's stick to what we need to do rather than do all the nice to have. And so the judgment now from those ministers will be going through their portfolios and sorting out the need basket versus the nice to have. It's a genuine um, exercise that she has asked them to do. And I don't think there are any foregone conclusions. What the finance minister has excuse me, indicated is, you know, he wants ministers to come to him with that thinking having been done themselves rather than him having to be the one to make all of those decisions. So, and that makes sense because those ministers are closer to their portfolios. They understand what's going on in them and it's much better for them to be able to look at them and say, well, we really need to do X, but we may not need to do Y until the economic conditions allow. Oh, Michael, are you still there? Sorry, I don't know what happened. But, um, yes, I am being good. Um, one of the obvious ones is the Radio New Zealand Television New Zealand merger. There's hundreds of millions of dollars involved there just emerging and then in propping up that new agency. Would be that the, would be that the kind of thing that you would say, oh, we don't need to do that in 2023? That wouldn't, would that be your priority? I think those are the decisions for the Broadcasting Minister and Minister of Finance and Cabinet Ministers. Obviously, the opposition has a view about that. Um, that's not my view. And, uh, you know, I think that it, it, they need to look at that particular project and then also look at it relative to other ones. That Those are for decisions for okay, them. Okay, but, you, but, but having said that, you know, you're an MP, you're a part of that caucus, you have a input into that policy making. As a personal choice, as a personal view, would you defer that until economic conditions were better or would you still keep going ahead next year? Honestly, Michael, I, I don't think I'm across the detail of that and being able to compare it with other things going on in other portfolios to make that call. So um, I'll have a clearer idea in the summer when we sit down as a group and ministers give us their feedback of what isn't, isn't important. Okay. You are a very interesting MP. You see, when I was a backbench MP, I'd be demanding some input into corporate cabinet decisions because my argument was I was the MP for Hawke's Bay. Uh, these decisions are affecting my constituents. You want my support on this. You better discuss it with me beforehand. Do you have those discussions in your caucus? Absolutely we do. Um, and they are subject to caucus confidentiality. So what, there are some of us who advocate very strenuously within our caucus 
um, and form coalitions to do that advocacy, and that's how government works. We do it behind closed door, and we're a unified team. Okay, um, so which that leads me no, segues beautifully into the other critical aspect of 2022 seemed to be, it got a lot of media comments certainly in the last six months, is the rise and uh, power and influence of the Maori caucus within your party. Um, is, that, is that real, do you think, or is that a media illusion? I think that there's an overstatement of the amount of power they exert within a caucus because even to say power is kind of an interesting framing. We all try to have influence within our caucus and we organise to have influence, just like the wahine, you know, the women's caucus do or or Pacifica or whatever. Uh, But it's a negotiation and it's a discussion. When we talk about a power balance, it sounds like one faction is dominating another and that isn't uh, how our caucus works and and I I don't think it's a fair characterisation to be honest. So you'd reject, would you, the view that the Maori caucus have an untoward influence upon government policy making? I do reject that and the reason why is because we are quite, um, and I think it's interesting given there are 64 of us, we are very aligned in our values base. I would have thought going into this as a newbie that there would be um, more robust discussions on some things, but we're very aligned on values, including uh, what needs to happen with mana whenua and our Māori population in order to A, um, correct the wrongs of the past, and B, ensure that they have a level of self-determination over their future, which is going to benefit all of New Zealand. We're very aligned on that. Except that it hasn't been defined what that is, and that's one of the things that's making us all out here in normal land nervous, is what is the level of self-determination? Um, and I think a number of mm, political commentators, forget the National Party, forget what ACT is saying, but a number of political commentators, the latest was sort of Jim Bolger and um, Doug Graham, you probably would have seen that this week, saying, for God's sake, define to us what you mean by co-governance. What do you mean by self-determination? What's the detail of this look like? Is that a fair um, request? Is that a fair argument that these people are putting to you? I think they're legitimate questions and I think the answer will depend on um, which sectors we are looking at and also, you know, does that then require a, a, a higher level constitutional debate about what the status of the treaty is and we've discussed this before I'm not sure New Zealand's ready for that yet but I do know for example that the way that would be looked at in the health system would be different than in other sectors because when we are looking at health there is so much evidence to show the unintended impact on Māori through um, you know things like because uh, or, or just take another example superannuation if you've got a shorter life expectancy because of the um, health impacts that are occurring to Māori because of a colonised health system and just deprivation and poverty and all the other things. So somebody has got a shorter life expectancy, they don't get the benefit of their superannuation for the amount of time that somebody with a longer life expectancy. Now that type of, so how do you mitigate or correct that is going to be a different conversation than if you're looking at, say, water infrastructure. Okay, but so, so what, well, what does co-governance mean to you? Because I, I don't know what it means, um, and I'm sitting on a regional council when they talk about co-governance coming into local government. Does co-governance mean to you 50-50? Um, or does co-governance mean to you you're just going to put a couple of mana whenua on a couple of policy committees, which in lots of ways just looks like window dressing to me? Yeah, so you're talking about the process. For me, co-governance is about outcomes. So it's uh, Māori having a real um, a real seat at the table and real o- influence over the decisions that affect their lives and that they have a stake in. So how you do that, again, is going to depend. You know, in some cases 50-50 might be appropriate. In other cases, it will be a different mechanism. I don't think we should get hung up on the process. You've got to look at how do you achieve that outcome and then work back and go, how, how are we going to do that? What does that process look like? And that's effectively what has happened through the Waitangi a tribunal approach to this. 
uh, I do have some sympathy for commentators who say, well, why is this happening at common law rather than as a higher level constitutional discussion? And I think in time, we do need to have that discussion, but it's very tricky, as you know. Um, and any government of any persuasion is probably going to want to you know, park that. It's, it's quite a big one to have. One of the bravest things I think we've done is have the three waters reforms because it does go some way to resolving that in one sector and it's something that many governments have kicked down the road for a long time. We now need to do something about it so we're having to have those conversations. Don't you find it slightly insulting that you think that New Zealand can't handle a big discussion and debate over something as critical as co-governance? No, I don't think so. I think it's... um, we we are having the debate. It's already starting. It's how do you manage it in a way that is safe for everybody. And when we look at some of the misinformation and the how that was expressed and the impacts with the protests at Parliament and the real feeling of insecurity and um, lack of safety that some people are feeling, including actually women politicians, I'm not sure that now is the right time. You know, and particularly not when there are so many other pressures on people at the moment. So it's very easy for people to become polarised and positional because they're under pressure. You know, in when it's an easier time when we're not facing these financial pressures, I think that is a better time to have a debate that will be more mature and more productive and stop people feeling unsafe. And when I say the debate, of course we're having the debate, but I think in a more organised and more formal way. Yes, but, it, but then that's just cowardice because what you're then doing is I'm saying, I'm coming up with these principles. I'm not going to define what they look like. I don't know to explain to the detail, hey, you're not mature enough to handle this yet. But So I'm going to leave it to the courts and they are then going to have to interpret it. A whole series of unelected officials who live in a rarefied atmosphere and who are not in contact with the New Zealand public. And, and I would have no, thought... No, we're not doing... We're not doing it that way with Three Waters. It is in the legislation. So we are, you know, we are taking it on and we are doing it within the sectors um, where we are reforming. We're doing it in the health system. Um, so so I reject the premise of that. I think where you, uh, what you're alluding to is that kind of border. What does our written constitution look like? And where does the treaty sit within that? No, I'm actually talking about the co-governance and Three Water and the Water Entities Bill. I've gone through that bill. Um, th- words like incorporating Tamana Otawai and how that is going to be interpreted. Um, it's not spelt out in any legislation that I've seen. And I know sitting on a regional councilling grid, we're struggling with how do we actually interpret this at a ground level basis? What does it mean? Um, and, and there's nothing in the legislation that points us to that. So... I think it is, it is a fair question to say, or a fair imposition to put on to our elected officials, when you say this, what do you mean in detail? Otherwise, we'll just have to make it up as we go along and probably get it wrong. And it may have different meanings in different parts of New Zealand. So um, allowing that flexibility for the elected people in those places, working with mana whenua to determine what te mana or te wai means in their region is really important to avoid a centralised approach that many people have, you know, have said, have been critical of. We don't want to be too prescriptive in the legislation because then we do have a very centralised approach and the legislation is deliberately drafted to allow that flexibility so that local communities can, can create what those things mean for themselves and that's the counter argument all right um i guess we'll talk about this more because it's not going to go away that issue and neither is the economy but in the meantime i wish you well can i just say one thing i thought the um arrogant prick comment um had a lovely conclusion yesterday with david seymour and the prime minister signing off a joint hansard that they are now um uh, they are now auctioning off i think um on trade me uh, for some form of charity. That was a nice way to end the year. Only in New Zealand. Yes, I think that's probably true. <laughs> okay, thanks Ingrid. Thanks, you have a good Christmas. Have a Christmas. You look out yourself. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. All right, um, that will elicit, it already has, <laughs> that conversation, some very strong reactions.